Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm here in studio with the Mayor of RPV, Jerry Dehovic. We just love having you here. And well, I have thank to you, say, Liz. Um, you have been here every month since the beginning of the year, since you started as mayor, and I appreciate that because you update the residents so well on all the issues coming before you on the council. And so, being November, there'll be the changing of the guard at your first meeting in December, so this for now is our last get-together in studio for the year 2014, so thank you. Well, let me just say it's been <laughs> my honor and privilege, and uh, you and Mark and the rest of the crew, Marie, and everybody have, have done an outstanding job, and I look forward to doing these shows with you, so I'm going to miss it. And I know if you're watching CNN, Anderson Cooper has a th thing he calls keeping them honest. And I felt like when you were here, you're always keeping us straight. Because you really, for all the you know residents, they watch the council meetings. And what we try to do here on City Talk is sift through it and talk about the actions that you took. And I mean, you have a lot of business and it's a lot to sift through for the residents. And this helps, I think. It, it is. And, and hopefully, you know, we serve to not only, uh, you know, delve into some of the, the detail, but, you know, for those who couldn't actually sit through a council meeting, we try and give them a highlighted update. And I think I think we, we've done, collectively, we've done a good job at that. All right, so let's get going because in the month of November, you've had um, some important meetings and issues come up, but the number one thing I feel like residents are looking at to see what's going on with the search for a city manager, big deal, where are you in the process? Well, we're at the tail end of it, Liz. Uh, you know, our timeline, we talked about completing it by year end, and I think we're gonna be right on the mark. Uh, the council worked very hard to, to move the process forward. Uh, Bob Murray of uh, Bob Murray & Associates did a great job in bringing us six very, very qualified candidates. Um, we worked hard over the weekend in deliberating uh, early mornings. Uh, we brought it down to two candidates, and the council has recently at our last meeting selected one candidate and uh, Bob Murray on our behalf is moving forward with negotiations and we will hopefully uh, be able to bring a contract back for ratification you know at a public meeting uh, at some point in the not too distant future. Okay so probably by the end of the year I know I was trying to have the mayor give us a sneak preview of who this one candidate is but um, yeah, we're you were excited. a little sneaky with that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we, we will uh, stay tuned for that and it's you know so it is a big deal um, because then it's the future of our city, really. This will be the person that will, you know, take direction from council and, and then move it forward. Well, this individual is the CEO of our municipal corporation, and they set the tone and tenor uh, not only for residents and the city council, but primarily staff. You know, we have 70-some-odd employees, both full-time and part-time, and, you know, there's uh, the... the Things start from the top down, and we're very, very excited about this. So hopefully we'll get that done in very short order. All right. Um, as we continue to talk about employees in the city um, from the top, now we have what's been happening with the um – uh, you've been looking at the classification and compensation study for right. the um, employees in the city. How is that going as the association of the employees formed? Now it was in 2011. You're trying to get that moving along. This was a process that the council thought and, and unanimously thought we needed to go through because we hadn't had a third party class and comp study uh, for, I think it's over a decade. It might have even been two decades, but we did some internal studies and it is paramount that we get this right. We are the first council dealing with a, an employee association. Um, we wanted to do things methodically. I think we've accomplished that. Uh, part of that and part of the biggest things in dealing with the union is obviously compensation. Everybody wants to talk about money. That's probably item number one and then obviously benefits and working conditions and rules, etc. But uh, we needed to know exactly where we are um, as far as compensating employees and you know this council has said publicly and privately we want to be fair we actually want to pay on the higher side of things you know I think the council policy right now is that we pay in the uh, at least the 75th percentile of comparable cities so we had to know who those comparable cities were hence we went out and got a compensation uh, and uh, classification and compensation study so so and I mean again because this sort of started the association forming after 2011 they're waiting again they just say we want fair pay right the employees and there's about 40 plus is that what we're talking about this that's right I think it's I think it's in the high end of the 40s I think it's 47 48 participants in the in the union so when do you think that you'll move forward well we're anticipating the uh, class and comp study uh, really the compensation side of it and just for clarity we had to pick comparator cities right. that's where we're going to get the compensation uh, comparisons. 
Um, and, and we're looking in the early part of next year. You know, this process took a lot longer than, than it probably needed to. Um, it, uh, for a whole host of reasons, getting to an initial MOU uh, took much longer than it should have. But, you know, we, we are trying to move this along as rapidly as possible. And when you say uh, comparator cities, you've, you've got 10 now selected. That's and you'll right. Take a look at those cities. And there was a list that the... Uh, um, the uh, person that the group we hired has now come up with. So are you satisfied with that list? Does that seem spot on in terms of the cities you'll compare to? We are. And, and uh, you know, I, I know that there was uh, some commentary about why it took two meetings to, to get to that finalized list, which, by the way, the only change was two out of the ten cities. Um, and, and I don't remember which council person uh, made mention of it, but the bottom line, we can't talk amongst ourselves uh, outside of a public arena. And therefore, you know, we had a, a series of questions that needed to be answered. And when those were answered, we were able to give the consultant, Coffin Associates, uh, a little more direction with, with some specificity that we thought was important as the decision makers uh, in bringing those comparator cities forward. So I think we've got a good list. I think it's going to give us a, a, the right roadmap. And again, it's one tool out of a whole host of considerations when we when we start getting down to numbers. All right, well, we'll keep getting updated about that in 2015. That's forward. probably uh, <laughs> the right time frame, early 2015, All as right. quickly as possible. Bring us up to speed on what's going on with the uh, telecom portion of the utility tax. Um, there's going to be uh, money refunded to the residents after that tax was, um, I don't want to inappropriately, you know, put out there to the residents. Or yeah, erroneously, erroneously is a good word. Or, yeah, but uh, yeah, where we are in that is the, the council has approved the methodology on how individuals, residents can get refunds. We're going to notice every household um, as to what that process is by mail. It's going to be on the website, et cetera. And they're going to have three different ways they can do it. Number one, they can, they can file a claim for just a flat fee without doing anything. I think the number is $25. We've done, our attorneys have done some analysis and figured out that's, that's about right. 25 per household or? Per account. Per account. So if you had three cell phone accounts and a house account, it would be per account, not okay. per household. Uh, the other way of doing it is you can, you can get one bill and extrapolate. And let me say this too. It's not for a year long period. It's actually for a 17 month period because we, we came up with the decision to stop collecting the UUT, uh, the telecom portion of the UUT in August. So retroactively, we're starting back on, going back to August 13th of last year, 2013. But by the time we put the telecom companies on notice, and by the time they stopped collecting it, you know, we figured it'd probably be realistically between 90 and 120 days. So we just pushed it out to 120 days so, um, you know, the 12-month the period plus the additional time is actually a 17-month period. Um, we gave an extra month for, for a little wiggle room. So but the fact that the city isn't collecting that fee anymore, I think, was it about 700000 a year? It's a something? little less than that, but so that was the number we used when we discussed it. Is the council still considering going and saying, let's put this on the ballot and decide do we want to collect this fee in the future? Absolutely. We are most definitely going to do it. And we are, there was talk, uh, I'm not sure, again, who brought it up, whether it was a resident or a council person, that we should look at the whole UUT, uh, take a peek at it. But we definitely want to put it in front of the residents as as you know, the law requires. Okay. And just to close the loop on that, the third option, the second option was take one bill and use that as a representative example, times it by the number of months. And the final uh, methodology would be collect all your bills. And that's probably for businesses that probably pay quite a bit more in UUT. If they want an explicit number for that refund, they can go down that road too. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for that update. Um, also making headlines uh, was what's happening with Green Hills. Mm -hmm. um, the latest, the Planning Commission has uh, put a moratorium on rooftop funerals. Sort of explain what that means and what's going on there with yeah, that Yeah, well, that, that, that unfortunately is a very touchy situation on multiple fronts. Um, you know, we're dealing with, with loved ones that have departed and, and have been buried. You know, if this was just a building code issue, it would be one thing, but there's a... Um, other complex issues that are, you know, we don't we don't want to cause the city definitely does not want to cause uh, um, families any undue distress or grief or what have you. But you know, we we have a situation here, and there there have been multiple errors on on the part of several parties. We're trying to straighten it out. Um, the first step that the planning commission took was let's let's not exacerbate the problem. Let's until this comes in front of the council, which is going to be the next step. Um, 
let's hold off on any additional burials in the areas in question, which, which they passed, and that is on the mausoleum rooftop itself and the northwest section um, that there was also another issue uh, with and as far as encroachment into setbacks, et cetera. Right. So it's, uh, you know, as our friends uh, in, in uh, Great Britain likes, it's going to be a sticky wicket no matter how you look at it. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure everyone's going to be happy with the final resolution. I'm not sure what that resolution is going to be. It's a very, very complex issue. Uh, a lot of legalities involved. Because there's multiple issues. Multiple issues. And, and we're, you know, we're, we have actually done two things. We actually hired a, a third party, uh, Lilly Consulting and Associates, to go out and take a look at uh, the entire CUP approvals that, that were uh, afforded to Green Hills and look at that compliance. And they came up with a couple little things here and there. We're also conducting an internal uh, quote unquote investigation. Uh, to see what exactly happened here and ensure we don't have something like this happen again because it, you know, to use the word debacle is, is, uh, is probably appropriate. It's a debacle. Mm -hmm. And for our residents that are watching right now but haven't been closely following it, just to take us back a step, when it, it all sort of came about when it became discovered that Green Hills, the mausoleum, for example, um, should have had a larger setback than how it was built, right? That's, that's right. It, how it started and then... That's, that's <laughs> part of it and was it in the right location and, and the way it really started is you have um, condo owners I think it's the Vista Verde condo uh, complex in Lomita that butts up against that mausoleum. And what happened when it was ultimately built, it, it is very close to the property line. It uh, uh, impedes whatever view they had, most of the residents. And now they have to, you know, from, from 25, 30 feet away, they're looking at people's funerals off their balconies. So it's, it's a problematic situation. I am I'm very sympathetic to, you know, where they are. but. You know, the other side of the argument is that, you know, it went through the normal process and went through notification process. So there, there's a lot of things that have to be ferreted out there. All right. Well, you will keep us updated. And I know that Green Hills, regarding that moratorium on the rooftop funeral, says I think it was November 26th was the cutoff to appeal it. Whether, but the, right now we're not there, so we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. They, they have uh, there are certain legal rights that they may pursue. Uh, the other thing that the Planning Commission wanted them to do was apply for a variance. So, you know, basically saying that this this differed from the code that was in place and going for an after the fact variance. So we'll see what happens there. Okay. Well, one thing we know that's going on, this next story, I have to say this line, it says, for the birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe for the birds, right? <laughs> we won't yelp about it. <laughs> um, that, of course, is at your last council meeting, uh, what big story was the fact that we're seeing a huge surge in the peacock population, <coughs> RPV specifically, I think it's the Vista Grande neighborhood. That's a big one, yeah. And so um, whether you, you know, love the peacocks or don't want peacocks, there is an issue with seeing too many peacocks in, 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 in the community right now. At least that's what's presented to you. Talk about what you know about the peacock, peacock population and what you're going to do about it. Yeah, well, there, you know. Rancho Palos Verdes is about 13 and a half square miles of city and there are five or six areas that are primarily affected by the peafowl and, and all that goes along with it, you know, the noise, the, the dirtiness, the uh, damage to property, uh, homes and cars, you know, they like chrome. Um, and this is, this is not a new issue. This, is, this has come up before various councils over the course of the years. There was a, a thinning of the herd in 2000. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I think also in 2009, but there seems to be an explosion in the in the peafowl population for whatever reason. Um, you know, and unless they're in your yard or tearing up your car, you're probably not too interested. They're beautiful birds, and we get that. But this council is very, very sympathetic to uh, what kind of disruption you know that that these birds bring for the peaceful enjoyment of people's residents. You know, screaming, they they howl horribly in the middle of the night. People have to sleep during the day and again defecating in yards and tearing up your vegetation and beautiful birds but they are problematic so the the council in its entirety was very sympathetic to these residents and i think it's it's long overdue um you know the city of palos verdes estates and this was one of the questions we had they they have uh, a number of 21 birds in 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 i don't know if it's a gaggle or a herd but in the various sections that they have the birds and we don't know what that magic number is yet. So we're asking some experts to come in and tell us what would allow them to be sustainable, by what, but really gleaning it down to the bare bones so it's not 
as intrusive to neighbors. But I think the numbers showed, like in the last year, the population. I don't know if it doubled. But pretty close. Saw, pretty uh, close. And and back in 2009, was it when the council did pass an ordinance which um, said you can't interfere with the trapping of the birds? Don't feed them. And you're not supposed to be. Feeding don't interfere them. with the trapping. So you, you've got a lot of residents that say leave it alone and don't touch it. So that that's a very touchy subject too because it's a violation of the law. So what's going to happen next? Though I mean, is the city actually going to get involved in trapping? Yes. That is what we've, a, we've asked. We've asked staff to come back with a proposal from a professional trapper to give us additional information and to give us a proposal. Right. And a program like that would cost what? I remember I thought I saw from back in 2010 when there was trapping, it was like, was it $30,000? Something like that. I think it was 33000 in 2009. Again, it depends on the number of birds and how difficult it is to do that. And then interestingly, the birds all go to Lancaster often. They take them. Do you know they what's do. Going they, on over they've there? got a nice uh, bird resort out in Lancaster. <laughs> and, you know, they treat them very well out there and they thrive out there. And, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think uh, Mr. Vanderlip way back when thought that we would be in the predicament we are now. There was a nice cartoon that got passed around by a very concerned resident. It was, it was totally apropos. So. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to check out that cartoon. Was it yeah. pro-PFAL or not? Uh, I think it was just, it was, uh, was kind of jokingly saying, oh, you know, something with Mr. Vanderlip. I don't remember the exact story, but it was uh, it was in the PV. It was in the P Peninsula PV News. So right. we'll go back another and another story at it. for the birds. That's so. right. <laughs> so all right. Well, um, again, it gets, becomes emotional because they're 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 friends of the peafowl, and they will be planting. I had a friend of mine that had was um, you know was having a nervous breakdown because her neighbor was planting a uh, very peafowl friendly type garden so they mm. would come and feed and then she's taking measures to scare them away and it's, it's it's a tough one well the one thing i do want to say is we do not want to hurt any of the birds you right. know they had that problem in rolling hills estates when someone was actually shooting a whole host of birds and that was that's right. totally unacceptable right. and again against the law and those people should be brought to justice so. okay okay um <clears throat> another update looking for Wreck and Parks. A lot seems to be happening there. Um, we were at the uh, reopening of Abalone Cove Shoreline Park. I know you were, I don't know if you, you came by after the... I drove by thing. and went after the, most of the festivities were done. Unfortunately, I had to attend a funeral, but uh, yeah. I understand uh, Mayor Pro Tem Knight did a fantastic job. Right. And, and, uh, and that's just such an uh, awesome place to be. It really is. You just got to drive by and look at it. But, you know, I'd encourage everybody to get out there and go walk around the, the, the staff and, and, uh, the contractors did a great job. It is a, uh, it's like, to, I'll use your word, it's a jewel, another jewel in our, in, our, uh, in our stable of jewels. And, uh, but it is just outstanding. They did a great job. And, um, and got grant money to update and do the, the restoration. Quite a bit of grant money. The whole project was about a million dollars. And I think that, uh, you know, about 660,000 of it was grant money in two different tranches, the actual park improvements and then some infrastructure with the parking lot and the bathrooms, et cetera. But yeah. it's, it's an outstanding it's, location. It's a special spot. Um, but on the subject right now, the parks, you're going through, a, the city's going through a parks master plan update, getting the community involved. There's like a dozen meetings all over the community that the public can attend to talk about different parks in their neighborhoods. A dozen different meetings. I know there right? was just one held at PVIC. There was. And you went. How did uh, that go? It was it was a highly attended, you know, well attended meeting. I also attended one in Ladera Linda, which is I live right next to that neighborhood, right up below Ladera Linda. And uh very well attended there too. You know, the, the neighbors are passionate about what goes on in their neighborhoods and they're obviously the ones that are most affected. You know, uh, there was a meeting down at Eastview Park, but you know, people on the west side not that they don't care, but they're not as affected as what goes on in Eastview Park and vice versa. Hess Park, you know, someone lives on the east side, unless they're visiting regularly, may not be as affected. So you've got a lot of local input, as it were. And that's exactly what we're looking for. What, what, does it, what do the neighborhoods or neighborhood want? What's acceptable? And those messages differ from neighborhood to neighborhood. So uh, it was very interesting to see what, what the neighborhood wanted uh, the Ladera Linda and Seaview neighborhood for the Ladera Linda complex. And it's, it was abundantly clear the way Corey Linder and, uh, and Dan Troutner and those guys and, and, and uh, Mona, the whole crew there, the whole staff that was, it was, you know, there was probably eight staff members there at that meeting and probably 30 residents. And, uh, you know, the message came through loud and clear the way they tracked it and put the little dots and what do you want, what do you don't want. And they're, they're receptive to the community input and they're going to assimilate all that and come back with recommendations for the council. Of course, the big, so. the big thing is balancing, you know, active use, passive use. You've got the people that just want to like leave the park space alone, really have it all be about nature. And then you have others that want a lot more activities and 
You're right, what and and it depends on happening. the park. Yeah, there's not, there, for example, the Darylinda, we keep coming back to that one, it's not so much a passive park, it's an active use, but the question is what active uses do you want, you know, from an extreme to, you know, a, a community center, to a gymnasium, to a pool, to a, you know, tricycle track for kids. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a whole wide spectrum of things, but then there are other parks that, you know, have not been improved thus far, and some, like you said, would rather keep them, uh, uh, preserved as they are. And those um, those uh, meetings for the public to be participating in, they're posted on the city website and they go all the way through February. That's so right. There's, there's there, more to there was actually a mailer too that was sent out and it'll right. be in our quarterly, uh, everywhere everywhere we can get that, the list of dates out there because we really do want the input because it's the neighbors who live there right. are going to be most the affected. using the parks. All right, so here we are in doing sort of a year in review in this program. I'm hoping 2014 did a lot. Um, just if you could sort of some of the biggest accomplishments you think for you, but in the entire council. Yeah, I've got, I actually, uh, I knew that question in advance and I made a bit of a list here. Um, I've got four categories and in general, uh, we started, and I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly because there's a lot here, but you know, we started out the year by simplifying our council goals. We had a very extensive list of council goals and we, and we, we shortened it and gleaned it down and made it much more, um, specific and measurable you know you can't really accomplish goals and uh, unless you can measure it so that's something we did uh, we talked about it earlier the initial MOU we finally got done early in in, in my tenure as mayor um, that was a long time in coming and it took a lot of work and and uh, um, that was a much much needed step and we also talked about the class and comp study we had to go through that whole process of Originally, are we going to have a class and comp study, finding a vendor to do it, vetting the vendors, selecting the, the consultant to do it, giving counsel input, giving additional counsel input, having them come back with their data. So that was a long process and, you know, we already discussed where we are with that. Uh, the city manager search, you know, that sounds real easy, but it was the same thing. We had to decide, okay, what kind of city manager do we want? Do we want to hire internal, external, or we're going to get a consultant? We have to select that consultant, interview the consultants, then we have to select the job description. We had public outreach. We had two public meetings on the criteria for the city manager. We wanted to be as inclusive as possible. And they, there was an online survey. Um, and we are where we are on that. I don't need to rehash all that. But I think you know both of those uh, 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 projects and processes were, again, very methodical and, and done the right way. So hats off to my colleagues on that. Um, Updated the coastal specific plan. Now I bring that one up because that, that had a lot of public play too. And you know, we're very sensitive to view protection and open space and there was a big debate on that. We finally got that rectified, you know, the viewing station issues. Right. So <laughs> that was uh, again with, with a lot of public input. So we were, we were very pleased to get that done. Um, one of the other accomplishments, and, and uh, I want to give the staff credit for this, you know, we had the tragedy with uh, Joe Sanchez down at Abalone Cove. Um, actually inspiration point down there but you know we, we created the uh, Abalone Cove Safety Task Force and uh, that if you if you really look back on what what a horrible time that was because of you know any loss of life but that was a young life there and it was tragic and um, but the city along with the fire department and the lifeguards and the sheriff's department really stepped up and manage that process because they shut that thing down several times throughout the summer when the tides and the rip currents got very very problematic and I think we probably saved a few lives there yeah, I, I have I to think believe that you were very very aggressive and I think in that campaign on getting the word out and I think really building awareness to not so much alarm but inform and about the safeties of going down there I mean it looks like a beautiful place looks like the Caribbean but you know those waters are so dangerous when those high surfs come in and I think even the local residents that were used to going down there were thinking twice about it, you know what? Absolutely. And you, so. you really just go to Abalone Cove Rescue, you, you Google that if you can, or YouTube it, and you will see how quickly it changes. There's people swimming leisurely in there, and that surge came in, and they were getting tossed around in the right, rocks. So right. anyway, hats off right. to staff on that. That was a big accomplishment. Um, the Parks Master Plan update, that's huge too. You know, we, we were talking and looking at a lot of different um, um, improvements to various parks and we stepped back and said well wait a minute we don't want to do this piecemeal we want to do it methodically in an organized manner so we're doing the parks master plan update so that, that's very good perfect segue into another broad category is infrastructure how can we say uh, one of our biggest accomplishments without mentioning san ramon the largest infrastructure project in the uh, city's history 
And, uh, you know, again, congratulations to the various councils and staff. That was, you know, 10 years in coming. You know, it, it finished on our end, uh, you know, on, under our watch. So we'll take some credit for it. But there was a lot of people, yeah, that was the great. consultants, and that was, that was a good community effort, a lot of community involvement. So congratulations to the city on that. Abalone Cove Shoreline Park, we talked about that too. We've got another jewel in our, in our treasure chest. Uh, great job there. Palos Verdes Drive East, you know, it's funny. I've gotten more compliments on the way Palos Verde, the, the remediation of Palos Verdes Drive East was handled. You know, you don't think about that big uh, Just last night I was at a function and a resident said, you know, I have to tell you, the way the flagmen were courteous and they moved things around, it was very well planned. I have to say, <clears throat> you know, that project in the past was put off because it was so difficult to manage because that's a major thoroughfare. Right. There are schools traffic, and homes, et cetera, you know? Yeah, it didn't seem like such an interruption like you thought it would be, maybe because it was the way it was handled. I mean, of course, it definitely caused... You had to be patient. There were times, you know, I was stuck there a couple times myself, you know, 15 or 20 minutes because they were doing something, paving something, you know, somebody's apron or what have you. But by and large, it was very well, re well received and well done. All about making it a safer road, for sure. <laughs> Well, if you haven't driven down the switchbacks, I would, I would encourage you to do it because it is just a pleasure of a ride. They have that new uh, rubberized asphalt, and it's terrific. It's, uh, you know, don't mention that to the skateboarders. But it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ryan Park, <clears throat> major improvements going on there, realigning the driveways and the access there and, and connecting the two uh, main parking lots, so that's big. Storm drains, big thing for me. I've been talking about it for a long time. We are finally, by the end of this year, we will have every storm drain at least cleaned out enough where we can map it and we'll have 100% of the storm drains mapped so we can intelligently make decisions, what needs to be remediated, what should go first, what can wait and what have you. The other big thing on the infrastructure side is the uh, IMAC, yeah. Infrastructure Management Advisory Committee. That, that was a, again, something that, that I championed at one point. There were several people that brought it up, but I, I recall bringing it up a long time ago and that's a, uh, that is a, a um, committee of seven citizens that are going to assist the council in, in what is a very complex issue in deciding prioritizing projects, how are we going to pay for this stuff, what do the people want, um, and we're very, very excited about that IMAC and the, the quality of people. We already talked about this, I think, at our last meeting. is just, just stellar. Just can't wait to get their input on this stuff. Uh, we also, <clears throat> during the year, took our first stab at the IMP which is the infrastructure, <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to get a chuckle out of you. Yeah. The infrastructure management plan. And I held uh, back on iMac. I, I think the last time I Yeah, you didn't like that one. Apple products. Yeah, uh, some right people now. think that, but we're, yeah. we're going to steal but that the one. the IMP. <clears throat> the IMP, and I thought we should get a better acronym. But anyway, it's an infrastructure management plan, which is a very long-term, cutting-edge um, uh, way of managing infrastructure where you take a very long-term view and an integrated view on all these projects and uh, how the monies come into play and what goes first, et cetera. It's a big coordination thing and that's something that uh, Public Works Director Michael Throne brought to us and you know, we took a first stab at it and, and uh, it was a little bumpy getting out of the gate, but I think ultimately we're going to be very well served by that. Because I think when it comes to infrastructure, there could be a wish list of about $200 million worth of projects. And there was. Yeah, yeah. we talked about it. I think it's down to about 130 now, but it was at one point it was close to $200 million, So. Right. And what's the budget of RPV this year? Uh, yeah, not, <laughs> nowhere near $200 million, that's for sure. Um, other things that we're proud of on the infrastructure side. We had a lot of trail improvements. We had the uh, Salvation Army Trail and the uh, California Coastal Trail and, and different improvements along the way. If you've noticed right on Palos Verdes Drive South, all that nice decomposed granite mm -hmm. getting put across from Tyrannia going in front of the Salvation Army and there, that linkage and that connection over there, uh, that's important. And one of the things we're looking forward to too is the improvements at, at our city council chambers, McTaggart Hall. Um, that is a long time in coming. We've had a lot of people comment that, you know, we need to step into the, the, the 21st century, as it were. But uh, we're looking at that. PV Drive South is going to be remediated. Uh, we're working on that, have been working on that. Sunnyside Ridge Trails, looking at that. Um, and another infrastructure thing, one of the things I think that it's, a, it's more of a quality of life issue is having um, the walls and fences on major arterials consistent. Nothing worse than having somebody have, you know, a, is a bad example, but you know, pink cinder block walls on two sides, and then someone coming in with gray in the middle and doing patchwork. So that the little things like that. That was the, those are those are big. May seem little, but they were big in my mind. All towards beautification of the city. Exactly. Uh, next category that we got quite a bit done was transparency. Um, 
for the first time, we, we uh, went out to bid for banking services, not a large contract, but we, we got our feet wet on that whole process and actually sele selected Bank of the West and have moved most of the monies over. There's a little bit left over for some transitioning reasons, but that was our first big uh, uh, going out to bid of a major contract. And, and we are in very short order going out to bid for IT services and also for legal services. So. That, that are, those are prudent steps um, that, that a city and any corporation, again, we're a municipal corporation, should take. And uh, we will go through those processes. Um, we finalized early on in my tenure uh, many of the matrix report recommendations. Uh, you know, we went through matrix and uh, piggybacked uh, uh, on a lot of their, the council decided what's important and what wasn't. And there was time, my staff did a great job of implementing most of that early on. Uh, we gave them some guidance, but we're, we're in, I don't want to use the word compliance, but we've incorporated a lot of their recommendations. We thought they were pretty good. Uh, one of the big things that was near and dear to me is early on in my tenure, and along with Councilwoman Brooks and I as part of the subcommittee and, and validated and approved by council, uh, part of our oversight, we, we approved what we called agreed upon procedures where we went back and looked at certain things and validated that, yes, financially, that's in fact what took place. Uh, everything from how vacations and, and benefits are attributed. We went back and looked at the city manager's contract. And one of the biggest things, you know, we're going we're gonna to go out to state controller at some point. We came up with what we call the CBA, which is the Compensation and Benefits Analysis. Yeah. Rancho Palos Verdes is so far ahead of the curve on that. We have actual dollars broken out by category, what it costs us for employees, their compensation and their benefits monetized. And it is, it is, it is above and beyond what the state controller right. requires. We created and a new template. We and did. Very transparent. And, 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 and congratulations to former Mayor Dida, who championed that for a couple of years, uh, worked very hard on it. I worked closely with them. And, and again, hats off to the council because they adopted it and we're, you know, so now residents can go on the city website and really find out what, what their tax dollars were, how they're paying the it always, of the city. It always bothered me when someone said, we really don't know what that person makes because the state controller, not to get into too much detail, wanted to see, you know, box five of the W-2. Well, you know, that doesn't mesh with this person's contract. So you have this disparity and that disparity has gone. So that, that was a major coup. Uh, the open ordinance, again, dealing with... Uh, um, agency negotiations and, and union negotiations is the uh, open uh, public engagement and negotiations ordinance where this is not going to be done behind the scenes behind closed doors all the information once once the actual negotiation starts all this is going to be transparent the the uh, residents are going to get to see who's proposing what what happened what the chain of events were uh, there's going to be economic analysis done. I didn't review exactly what it is, but go see what it is. Again, that's very, very cutting edge and very inclusive and transparent for the public. Uh, we've got a fraud, waste, and abuse hotline that we've recently ratified that is uh, um, in probably the first half of next year going to be implemented. And, and again, very, very cutting edge. We had talked about it for a while. Um, and uh, I think the current audit subcommittee came up with with some very good suggestions as far as implementation goes so um, I also personally took a stab at some additional oversight issues on June 3rd uh, we'll see where that goes in the future um, I think that uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback from residents just based on certain things we have going on in the city that they'd like to see a little more oversight not not council managing the city but they want to see some oversight and we'll, we'll revisit that at some point mm -hmm. next year also um, We'd mentioned earlier quality of life issues, you know, again, very small, but important to a lot of residents. The, you know, we, we adjusted construction hours because RPV originally had very early construction hours and there's some people that like to sleep. You know? So we adjusted that. <clears throat> also, um, with respect to aesthetics, you know, how long you can leave your trash cans on the street and where can you put them? You know, little things. Like that. We talked about peacocks. That's a quality of life issue. Um, and we also talked about and addressed on a on a, on a project specific basis, but we looked at it globally, how long construction projects can take if they are affecting the quality of life of your neighbor. If your neighbors are complaining about what's going on at your house, you know, if, if you're interested in the specifics, it's, you know, there's a four year, four year trigger point, And we, we came up with a whole host of rules and protocol how to deal with that. But those are probably uh, 
the biggest things you know that, that we accomplish as a council it's um, quite a list it is and you mm -hmm. all on the council pretty much you know have you work full time and have other jobs and so how you were able to accomplish all this you should let me say this thrilled. liz i got to tell you i went back and looked at uh the other day the number of meetings and said god you know we've with 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 the next and my final meeting as mayor, we will have had 40 official meetings as a city council. I'm not sure if that's been matched in the past. Maybe it has, but that's an awful lot. You know, people say, oh, you have two council meetings a month. Well, we had 40 official meetings, and that doesn't include subcommittee meetings, meetings with constituents, meetings with, with uh, ad hoc and standing committees that, that our council uh, members serve in, in the local government. So there's, we're very busy. and, and right. uh, and I, yeah. I was Congratulations you, to my colleagues yeah, on this. You I know, mean, as mayor, um, I was out thinking, you know, what did you find to be the most challenging um, thing for you, and um, and also your greatest accomplishment if you had to pick one. Another beautiful segue. The the biggest challenge was time, uh, having time to deal with everything that uh, that that one would like to deal with. You know, being you know, this is a part time job. You know, and I know. I put in many, many hours, as do my colleagues. But you know, theoretically, it can almost be a full-time job, depending how far you want to immerse yourself in it. But uh, well, time is the biggest just reading challenge. Just those agenda books that you get twice a month—that would take a week for me. And we get them on Thursday night, so it makes our weekends busy. And uh, we're talking about maybe adjusting that. Some councils, another nice segue. You know, give those books ten days or two weeks in advance. You get a little more time to digest it. Not only the council, but the residents are sometimes. Uh, um, you know, taken aback on how short of a time period you have to digest, which is sometimes a lot of material. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. probably the biggest challenge um, is just time. Uh, what was your second I question? I just said, if you had to pick one of your greatest accomplishments, something unique to Mayor Jerry DeHovic. I mean, you kind of went through, I mean, all these things you accomplished, you took part in, but right. there was one thing that you feel like, you know what? Can I, get, can I take more than one? I've oh. got, I got a few of these things. Um, you know, one of my... One of your my, top three. Yeah, there you go. I might, I might make it top four, but... <laughs> uh, Mayor's prerogative, right? All right. Um, one of the things that I liked and, and I had a lot of compliments on was just running a crisp, respectful meeting. I got a lot of feedback. People just said, saying, Pastor, you know, I like the way you run a meeting. You kind of move through it and all that. And that's, that's something that I wanted to do um, and, and try and instill that and move things along. And, you know, we had our fun, you know, when appropriate. But that, that was one thing I really... Uh, um, relished in doing and setting up these methodical processes and all these things you know i used that word three or four times and things that we discussed i was a proponent for that we i like to do things methodically and the we can measure things and we can report back to people so that was big uh one of my other <coughs> excuse me um things that that's near and dear to me is this whole marymount athletic field issue uh that kind of came out of the blue back in february and just you know uh, thought that this might be a good idea. And again, after several meetings with uh, school board president Aaron Lamont and uh, Marymount California University president uh, Michael Brophy, uh, we were able to come up with a one-year agreement where they're using the Merrillest Intermediate School athletic fields for college, college sports. And the idea being that's a precursor to them penning a long-term deal, a 15 or 20-year deal, which would prevent them and preclude them from having to build an athletic field that most of the residents in that neighborhood don't right. want. So they're still pursuing that, which is their right to do, and, and we're gonna go down that road, but we are, uh, we're excited about the potential there. And then, and then that, that further can morph into uh, community programs. We're already, you know, uh, again, uh, Corey Linder, uh, uh, Parks and Rec, Rec and Parks Director, uh, you know, we have a basketball league now over at, at Merrill S, the gymnasium over there. So we're starting to integrate all this and, and Marymount as part of this whole thing is, is offering their facilities, their tennis courts, their pool and all. So this could be a great thing for people, not only in all of RPV, but for the east side who's a little bit underserved when it comes to parks right. and recreation. Certainly an alternative that you put out there that has unbelievable benefits that wouldn't necessarily have happened with their own athletic field, and even though they may still be pursuing that. I mean, the fact that you're just spreading the wealth, so to speak, spreading the wealth in the community and... and um, Public public programs there. The the school district benefited. You know, Marymount put in 40, 50 grand just in current improvements and had students go in there and clean up. And the facility looks beautiful. And they've got you know very grandiose mm -hmm. ideas on much much more extensive improvements. So that's that's pretty exciting. Um, but I have to tell you, Liz, one of the the biggest things for me, uh, as far as accomplishments go, was was public engagement. I went to pretty much every event that I could humanly possible. And I've probably met 
you know, thousands, maybe a lot, but over probably a thousand different people and good people. But, you know, over the entire tenure, every councilman or councilwoman helps residents and the people reach out to them specifically. But as the mayor, everyone always pens everything to the mayor. And I've gotten involved in a lot of different things. And I, I just brought one of these letters. This is, this is what it's all about here. I got a resident wrote me an email and I just highlighted some of what she said here. She said, I just wanted to thank you for everything you did for me. You took an extra time to help me and made my night. I can finally sleep now. Thank you. And then she goes on a little bit more. Mm -hmm. yada, 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 and it says, um, thank God I had you to turn, uh, thank God I had you to turn to someone who understood everything and listened very intently to my issues. It meant the world to me that you were able to understand what I had to say. You had a lovely way of dealing with me, which shows in your meetings and in your personality. We're very lucky to have you, et cetera. Thank you so much again. I mean it sincerely, I can finally sleep. That's from a resident who was very distressed about a very complex issue. And there's a lot of that, Liz, and that's really what it's all about. That's what, you know, things from, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a, a cell phone box being put in someone's view that takes six months to get it returned. You know, I can go email after email, and I'm sure my colleagues can do the same thing, but that's really what I think is my greatest accomplishment. It's all about the service. You know, we accomplish a lot here, but, but affecting people's lives and, and what affects them personally is very important to me. So that, that's what and I consider my greatest. difference in that yeah. resident's life. And residents just want to be heard. They do. And, um, you but, know. you know, some things like that was very important to her may not be important to you. You know, right. we deal with things that are important to everybody globally, but that's, that's what I think each, that's what I relish, and I think that's what my colleagues do a good job of doing, too. So. Well, fantastic. Well, like, we can't thank you enough. You do so much for the city. Um, now as the uh, December 2nd council meeting approaches, that's when they'll have the uh, rotation of the council, the changing, Reorganization. changing of the guard. And right. um, um, so you obviously then will return as a council member. So whoever, we're assuming Mayor Pro Tem, Jim Knight, but that's usually, usually what happens. the way it works. That's the um, protocol typically. Right. Um, what advice will you have for the next mayor? You know, you and I chatted about that. <laughs> I got very simple advice. Just enjoy it. You're going to be very busy, and, and I'm going to have an offline conversation with Jim. We talked about getting together, but we've both been so busy, we haven't done it yet. But, uh, you know, with the, in anticipation of him becoming mayor, um, he's going to be very, very busy. But, uh, again, I love being mayor. You know, I really enjoyed it. I relished it. It was a lot of work. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you're inclined to do it, step up and do it and try and enjoy it. Yeah. How about for 2015 around the corner? You see any big challenges ahead for you as a council? Or we have a lot of issues, Liz. Actually, <laughs> coming up in 15, you know, public safety is always a big issue. You know, crime. Uh, you know, some of the statistics are down, but burglaries are up. I'm getting a lot of resident feedback that uh, you know they're very concerned about the brazenness of these break-ins. You know, we are, we live in a very safe community, but but burglaries are up, and when you're when your home is is broken into and your your personal space is invaded like that, it's problematic. So. Crime prevention is a big one going forward, and we also talked about uh, cameras and entrances to the city and automatic license plate readers and that whole issue, and that's being handled uh, at a macro level with all four cities. We'll see where that goes. There's been some meetings and discussion on that with the uh, Regional Law Committee. Um, funny enough, drones. I've had several people talk about the intrusion of drones flying around, so that's something we're going to have to address. Um, response times. Several, I live on the south side, so I talked to a lot of south side neighbors. Response times for sheriffs on the south and east side is a big deal. And we're talking to, about trying to maybe get a true substation. I'm, I'm throwing that out there to <laughs> get a plug. We'll see what happens on that. Uh, UUT litigation, we talked about that. We talked about the UUT refund process. We really didn't talk about that. There is a $5.6 million lawsuit that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, going forward, Green Hills, uh, we're gonna, that's going to be probably very... Uh, time intensive as we move through next year. Uh, one other thing that we really don't talk about that, that we really need to too is uh, we need to finalize our general plan update. That's been kind of swimming around in the background for the last couple of years and we finally really need to bring that to a conclusion. Um, trail, trail plans consolidation. We've got, I can't even list how many different trail plans we have out there. This, this is probably six or seven of them. We're finally going to go through the exercise of getting one trails plan so we can, we can talk intelligently about it. There are people that can't speak intelligently to, about trails and all these different plans, but um, it's complex for some of the rest of us. And obviously we have the storm drain user fee, uh, sunsetting in 16. Um, 
you know, residents have been assessed a fee for that, for, for storm drain remediation, and we're going to have to bring that back to the voters again, and that doesn't so happen another, overnight. So no, no time for you to rest in 2015. You have no. a lot going on. But yeah. right now we had, we're getting through this, the holiday season, of course, and um, it's time <clears> to obviously be with family, and hopefully you can take a pause. Uh, any holiday messages that you want to share, announcements as uh, mayor for the community? Well, there, there are several <laughs> things. First of all, I want to say a bunch of thank yous before I give that. I want to, I just want to thank you, Liz and, and Mark and, and Marie and your whole crew here. You've had people in and out of here. And, and again, I've said this a couple different times. You do a great job and it's been my pleasure. You've been very accommodating to me. I know uh, my schedule is, uh, as, uh, doesn't always fall in line. Time You're worth waiting I, for to get you in the studio. Well, thank you. I really <laughs> appreciate it. And you do a great job. Uh, I would also like to thank the residents, and I say this often, and, and, and I mean it, it comes from the heart. It really is an honor and a privilege for me to serve on council, and, and this year is mayor even more so. Um, just We got just a great bunch of involved, educated residents, and it makes it a pleasure in, in, for me to, uh, to devote this time to doing this job, and I enjoy the job, so it's good. I'd also like to thank my colleagues. You know, we, we have fun on council, and... Uh, uh, everybody's hearts in the right place I think and uh, you know although we may disagree sometimes you know we as you can just see by this list I kind of sat down and penned this list together we've accomplished quite a bit so anyone who says otherwise I'll take exception to that but we've done a good job on that front um, you know I also like to thank our commissioners and, and uh, planning commissioners and committee members we have a mayor's breakfast once a month and I just had one last Friday and the the these individuals devote an extraordinary amount of time to the planning commission. You know, if you watch that, those are very intense hearings. Those were hearings. Those are quasi judicial hearings. And it was very, very intense. It took a lot of time and a lot of study. And, uh, you know, they, they, they don't receive, I don't think, enough accolades uh, on what they do. So thank you to all of them. And that truly is a public service also. Um, also, as the outgoing mayor, I'd like to thank all the business leaders out there in the Chamber of Commerce. They were very, very uh, helpful and, and do quite a bit in the community from a uh, philanthropic standpoint, educating standpoint, and all the different uh, events uh, and, and things that they're involved with. Also, the fellow electeds, you know, we, we work closely. There was a mayor's lunch that we have with all the mayors and the, the president of the school board and the head of the library district. <clears throat> we try and work together with our sister cities on the hill and uh, Again, they've been very accommodating, and, and there's a spree to corn, a camaraderie there, so thank you to all of them. Of course, when you walk away from those meetings, you say, RPV rules, I know it. <laughs> yeah, I, I do, and, and, and everyone, all, they, they say the same thing. Yeah, you know? I know. But, uh, <laughs> and finally, I would like to thank my wonderful wife and daughters, because uh, there is a, uh, you know, when you have young kids, it's, it is being on council and being married truly is a family affair. Uh, they all did sacrifice and we kind of knew that going in and you know they benefited in many many other ways but there was a sacrifice but you know they bought me a new tie tonight for my last mirror show so thank you girls for that but uh, yeah. uh they are they're truly my dolls all three of them so um, and we had fun working with them when they would come out in the community especially your daughters i mean whether it was a community <laughs> cleanup event they were right there in the thick of it and just like you say that was a gift <clears> for them because they really saw what community service was about through what you were doing and very was, similar to what i saw in my father you know they see that service my daughter was on student council we just had all the the mm -hmm. students from their school out the other night and they were uh, uh all very impressionable and and came away very very um um what's the word I'm looking for, jazzed and excited about being a part of something, their student council and potentially what the future may hold. And you know, what's funny too, I said this before, you know, not too many kids look forward to a cleanup. You know, my yeah. daughters couldn't wait to go to Abalone Cove cleanup. So all these, you know, environmentally conscious uh, thought processes and that, that all gets ingrained. So it's, it's been terrific. We've had a good ride so far. So thank you. Um, as far as the message to the community goes, you know, again, I just want to wish everyone a very happy uh, holiday season. Uh, all the joy, uh, love, health, fellowship, enjoyment of your family. Um, you know, may all your wishes and dreams come true. 
and uh, wish everybody a safe and happy 2015 and God bless everyone. All right. And thank you again and happy holidays to your family. Wish you the best in the new year. And I know we'll still see you around here. Same to you. And uh, again, thanks for all you do for our I'll community. give you a hug. For oh, thank you. How's that? that. <laughs> oh, thank you so you much. You have been an amazing mayor. And we're well, so grateful you. to have you on the council. And again, Appreciate I just it. want to wrap up by telling everybody in the community, thanks for watching RPV TV and RPV City Talk. We wish you all the best over the holidays. Happy, healthy new year, everyone.